piece. This is a plot we're going to get really familiar with. Here's the electromagnetic spectrum, X-rays all the way through radio. Gamma rays are kind of off this plot, showing you the transparency of the atmosphere. Clearly, we have a window in the optical where it's 100% transparent. And so we go off into the near infrared, meaning infrared close to the optical. It's kind of wavering. It's come and go. Um, but we can do some science from the ground. And then and any other wavelength you can't except in the radio. And the radio, radio waves come through the atmosphere as well. But then you have regions that light can't get through. And let's talk about the reasons why light can't get through. So let's start on the, the high energy side. So gamma rays, x-rays, and the ultraviolet. The problem is ozone. Ozone is blocking that high energy radiation from coming down to the surface. And that's good because gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, they're bad for our health. Ultraviolet will give you a sunburn. The ozone layer, you've all heard about the ozone layer and the hole in the ozone layer, which is different from global warming. Don't get those confused. They're completely different things. We'll talk about it later. But the ozone is a protective blanket around us that absorbs these high energy photons. And so it doesn't get through. If you want to do astronomy in these wavelength regimes, we have to go to space. Then pretty quickly you hit the optical window. Not much transparency in the ultraviolet. And then once you get past the optical window, we get into the infrared, IR. And here the problem is two things. You've got water vapor in the atmosphere and carbon dioxide. These two things absorb light in the infrared regime. As we move farther and farther into the infrared regime, it becomes more complete. But in the near infrared, near the optical, we can still work our way in in those little windows of transparency. It's challenging, but we can do it. We can observe here and here and there, for example. But it's another reason we pick our sites to not only be high, but dry. A lot of the telescope sites showed you, you saw no vegetation, because there's no rain, and there's no moisture in the air. It's because water vapor blocks in the infrared. And a lot of the exciting science, the cutting edge of the most distant universe, a lot of that comes to us in the infrared or the near infrared. So we pick dry sites. But, you know, we can't get the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, or really the water vapor. So there are limits. Once you go far enough into the infrared, you again have to go to space until you get to the radio. I'll start with the short wavelength radio. That's coming back up on this tail here. Uh, the problem is, is again, water vapor and oxygen. And, of course, can't get the oxygen out of the atmosphere. We need that. But the short wavelength radio, it is weather sensitive. It is environmentally sensitive in terms of how much moisture is in the air. You do have seasonal observing cycles here. But then you go far enough into the radio and you're into a window. It's fully transparent until you get to the long wavelength radio. And this is really long wavelength stuff. You look at these wavelengths, 20 meters and longer. These tend to just bounce off the ionosphere. It's not a chemical that's absorbing them like in these other wavelength regimes. It just kind of comes in and scatters off in the space. So it's difficult to observe at really long wavelengths from the ground as well. We don't attempt it from space either. It's kind of an unexplored territory, the electromagnetic spectrum. where the light doesn't make it to the ground requires space-based astronomy. And NASA is the U.S. entity for that. And over the years, NASA has made these great observatories. That's what they used to be called. They don't use the term anymore, but we'll borrow it. Observatories. And there were four great observatories, and I'm going to show them to you and add a few others that would qualify as great observatories, more recent additions expanding these different wavelength regimes. And we'll start at the longer wavelengths, the infrared region here, where light doesn't make it down to the ground. Not the near infrared, which we can do from the ground, but the mid-infrared and the far infrared. You have to go to space. And so here's the telescope for that. So in the infrared, it's called Spitzer. And it's not a huge telescope, but just a little bit bigger than the Moorhead Observatory Telescope. It's mere as I recall, it's 0.8 meters, kind of small. But if you want to do infrared, this is where you go. It was launched in 2003, 
and the whole system was cool. And that's kind of critical, because as we talked about, we're all emitting infrared. That telescope sitting in space is emitting infrared. It wants to set the infrared from space, not itself. So it was cooled for a number of years. The coolant has run out, so it's not as useful of a telescope as it used to be. I'll just give you two examples of what you can do in the infrared. This is in the mid-infrared. Uh, this picture here is in the visible. I'll show it to you in the mid-infrared in a second. This is a star-forming region. You've got some stars. You can kind of see them in there. Stars form in clouds of gas, and clouds of gas are full of dust. And dust blocks short wavelength light. And the dust is small, and short wavelengths are small. So if you have dust in your cloud, and you have short wavelengths, the dust is big enough to block it. Some gets out, but a lot of it gets blocked by the dust. But if you have a big wavelength, it doesn't even see the dust. It goes straight on through. And a lot of the universe is obscured by dust. So if we go out of the visible, the redder we go, the better it gets. And go into the infrared, we can make all that dust disappear and see the stars as if there is no dust blocking the light. So here we go to mid-infrared, and there you go. We see the stars more clearly. The veil disappears. Again, there are all sorts of advantages to going to other wavelengths. You can do things that you can't do invisible. Here's another example, going to the far infrared. The galaxy is full of clouds of gas. The gas clouds tend to be cold, 100 Kelvin, 50 Kelvin, 10 Kelvin. But we know even something cold emits a black body spectrum. If you're cold, like I think this cloud is around 60 Kelvin, you're peaking in the far infrared. And this is a visible picture. It's the constellation Orion. You've got Rigel and Betelgeuse, the belt, and the sword. In the middle, you have the Orion Nebula. But this is all happening on the edge of a giant cloud of gas. Uh, on the edge of the cloud, the gas is getting compressed and forming stars. And you say, well, I don't see that. But if you go into the far infrared, there it is. If you had far infrared eyes, this is what you would see when you looked up the constellation Orion. It's a giant cloud of gas, cold but emitting thermal radiation. And you've got these hot spots where star formation is going on, like the Orion Nebula itself. But again, different wavelengths can shed different insight onto different aspects of the universe. So, infrared Spitzer. We talk about near-infrared, visible, ultraviolet. A lot of that can be done from the ground. Not all of it, but a lot of it can. But, as we talked about before, we have put a telescope up there to do it above the atmosphere, to get above the atmospheric distortions. That's Hubble. Here it is being released by the Space Shuttle Discovery. Uh, released back in 1990, and it's just been chugging along for two decades, doing remarkable work. But as we talked about, it's not the biggest scope in the world. It's about 2.5 meters, much bigger than Spitzer, but not big compared to ground-based optical telescopes. And it's, it's in low Earth orbit, so the astronauts can get to it. And since we've now retired the shuttle fleet, uh, it won't be serviced anymore. This was designed to be an observatory that you can go back and upgrade and fix when things break. And that's what we've done. We've had many missions to the Hubble Space Telescope where the shuttle astronauts get out and replace parts, fix things. Especially early on, when it was first launched, there was a mistake in the optics and all the pictures were blurry. You probably don't remember it firsthand, but it was a huge debacle for NASA. They spent all this money on this glorious space telescope and goes up and it's blurry. The things weren't spaced right or ground correctly. They tested all the components separately, but never put them all together. And once it got up into space, they realized they'd made a mistake. So the shuttle went up and basically gave the thing glasses, put a little corrector lens in there, after which it became the huge success story that it has been throughout their lives. So, you know, as the instruments uh, begin to fail, probably over the next five years or so, uh, there will be no fixing the Hubble, and that be it for Hubble. You, you've grown up with Hubble and looking at all these pictures. You know, we never really thought it would go 20 years. But there is plans for a replacement, and um, it's been in the news recently. It's over budget and poorly managed, and they tried to kill it off, but now it's back on the table. I mean, half the funding has been spent, so you don't really want to kill it off. And it is the replacement for Hubble, and it's the James Webb Space Telescope. So let me show you a little bit about that. And it's not going to be another 20-year mission. James Webb's probably only going to be a five-year mission. It's not going to be in low Earth orbit. It's, it's going to be far away from the Earth. 
Actually, I'll show you that first. We want it to be in a really, really dark location. And if you're close to the Earth, there's all sorts of scattered light coming off the Earth, coming off the Moon. And so, we're putting it at something called a Lagrange point. These are gravitationally stable points. Here we have the Sun and the Earth, and given any two objects orbiting each other, there are five stable or semi-stable points. And we're going to stand the James Webb Space Telescope out at position two. It's farther from the Sun than the Earth. Now, being farther out, you might expect it to orbit slower, take more than a year to go around the Sun, but because of the gravitational influence of the Earth, it will keep up. And so Earth will always be between it and the Sun, and it's basically going to be pointed away from Earth, from the Moon, from the Sun. So it's a very dark, dark location. It'll have shielding on its backside to prevent the stray light and heating up as you want to keep it as cold as possible. So here's uh, another diagram for that. Here's the basic idea, not to scale. Sun, Earth, and the Moon going around it. Out here we have the Lagrange point, and it actually goes in, in a little orbit around this semi-stable location. And the semi-stableness of it's nice because we don't have to expend a lot of fuel keeping it in position. It kind of floats there. It would drift away slowly with time, but with just a little bit of fuel expenditure, you can keep it where you want it to be. So this is a little movie of the replacement, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. Webb was the administrator of NASA during the moon launches. He's also a graduate of UNC. Uh -huh. This one will not be in low Earth orbit. It's going to be very far from the Earth at a stable point called the Lagrange point. So you can't service it. It's a one-shot deal. It won't be a 20-year mission. It'll probably last five years. And it won't be in the optical. It's a replacement for Hubble in terms of a large telescope in space. It's going to be six and a half meters. But it will be an infrared, a near-infrared red telescope. It's really interested in the very distant universe. In the very distant universe is the very early universe. And there's various reasons most of that light comes to us in the infrared. As the universe, you know, it takes billions of years for that light to get to us. As the universe expands, it gets stretched out with the universe. So it comes to us in the infrared. So if we want to push back farther in cosmic time, we need to look in the infrared. So we'll go out to this, we call it a Lagrange point, and it will deploy like this. The shields on the bottom are solar panels pointed towards the sun, blocking the sun out. So it's going to be incredibly dark, we're very far from the Earth, and we're going to be able to see fainter than we've ever seen before. Of course, the thing has to be launched, folded off, and then it has to deploy itself robotically. And this isn't far in the future, this is uh, sometime this decade, uh, probably um, 2016, 2017. I believe it's scheduled to be sooner than that, but you know, I wouldn't bet money on it. <laughs> So that's going to be the year generation's Hubble Space Telescope. And so it's going to be really cool. But, you know, it's only going to last about five years, that's the thing. During those five years, we'll do amazing things. Uh, let's move up to the X-ray regime. There's not too much going on in the ultraviolet right now in space-based astronomy. Now, as the budgets are getting tighter, particularly for NASA, they have to cut in other areas. And the ultraviolet is an area that's kind of been neglected and probably will be for some time. But a lot of attention has been paid to the X-ray regime. And the great observatory here is Chandra. That's the third that we've listed. We've listed Spitzer, Hubble, which will be replaced with Webb. Chandra, named after Chandra Sekhar, famous theorist in astrophysics. Now, X-ray telescopes, they use the same CCD detectors, but their optics, their mirrors, are very, very different. That's because the X-rays are so energetic, they go into the mirror. Now, if you have a mirror here, an X-ray coming, it's not going to bounce, it's just going to tunnel in and embed itself in the mirror. So you can't really make an image that way. But uh, you can actually get X-rays to reflect, just not on very 
steep angles. It has to be a shallow reflection. It's kind of like if you have a flat stone, you buy a body of water. If you just throw the stone down, it goes into the water. But if you throw it at a, a glancing angle, you give it some spin, it will skip off the water. And the same is true for x-rays. So it changes how we design our telescopes. Instead of having parabolic mirrors and all that, we have nested barrels of cylindrical mirrors. Whereas the light comes in, depending on where it's coming into the telescope, it might go in one barrel or another barrel or another barrel. We just have a whole bunch of them, so we collect as much light as possible. It's a sequence of shallow skips along the mirror that redirect all the light to the focal point. It's kind of a different way of doing things, but we have to. Here's another diagram that kind of illustrates it. Light comes in from the left, and it could end up in any of these barrels, but they all do a sequence of a shallow angle glancing redirections the light until it finally comes out all headed to the focal point where you can put kind of a traditional CCD detector. So here's Chandra. It was launched in um, the late 90s. And so here it is before launch. It was launched in the space shuttle, same as Hubble. Uh, Spitzer had its own launch vehicle. But the nested barrels are down here in the bottom. So light comes in from the bottom in this image, goes into the nested barrels, they exit the nested barrels here, and then from here all the way up to the detector, there's nothing. I mean, there's just structural, but it's empty space on the inside, and the light's basically been redirected at a shallow angle, and so it, it has a long way to go before it hits the focal point. The focal point's up here where you have your detectors. Now I'll just show you some examples of stuff you can do in the x-rays. There's tons of stuff. X-ray astronomy is a very, very active branch of astronomy. I'll just give you two examples. Now here is a combination of a visible photograph of, of course, Jupiter, and an x-ray image taken by Chandra. So the x-ray is the purple stuff. If you look in x-rays, you just see the purple stuff. You don't see the planet. The planet itself is uh, reflecting visible light, but it's not really emitting x-ray light, except at the north and south poles. And this is equivalent to the Aurora Borealis we have here on Earth. I don't think we talked about the Aurora Borealis so much. We did talk about Earth's magnetic field. We'll talk more about it when we get to Lesson 6. But Earth has this magnetic field generated from liquid iron in the core moving around in rapidly swirling patterns. It gives us this kind of force field that protects us from a lot of high-energy radiation. And coming from the sun, it can get trapped in our magnetic field and redirected to one pole or the other then it impacts our atmosphere, making this light show, the Aurora Borealis. We have a good picture of it. And it's, of course, more visible if you're from the northern or southern parts of the world. Here in North Carolina, uh, it's a rare treat to see it, and even when you do it, just a faint glimmer on the northern horizon. But nothing like this. This is taken from Alaska, probably. And actually, what you're seeing here is it's excited uh, elements in our atmosphere that have been de-excited, releasing green light and red light in particular. But if you look from space, there's also an ultraviolet and an X-ray signature that's been seen on Earth. And Jupiter just has a much, much more powerful magnetic field. And so as charged particles get stuck in its field, being more powerful, it gets redirected more forcefully, and you get a really strong X-ray aurora borealis. And actually, Jupiter has a moon called Io that's orbiting within its magnetic field and spitting out all sorts of charged particles. Our aurora borealis comes from the sun, charged particles from the sun. Jupiter's has that, but it also has a nearby emitter of charged particles that beefs it up a lot, so you get this X-ray signature. Here's just another example. Here's the Crab Nebula. You took a look at it in the radio. This is what it looks like in the X-ray. Sorry, if you zoom in on the Crab Nebula, there's a pulsar at the very center. A really compact object, about the mass of the sun, crammed into the space of Chapel Hill. Really compact object. Spinning quickly, it has a strong magnetic field, and as it spins around, the gas pirouettes around it, driven by this magnetic field. That pulsar nebula is something you can only really see in the X-rays. And it moves with time, it dances. Now, I should also mention Newton. Newton is part of the European Space Agency, uh, but it's equivalent to Chandra. I've described them both as great observatories, although the term originally was only intended for the NASA spacecraft. Chandra is better at imaging. 
It's not total duplication of effort. They actually complement each other nicely. Newton is more for spectroscopy. We do spectroscopy in the x-ray as well. There are all sorts of emission lines. They're very interesting up there. It can tell us what's going on physically in ways that we can't get from any other part of the spectrum. So as you're starting to see, we can piece together different types of information in different wavelength regimes. And this is Compton. It went up in 91, came down in 2000, so it's no longer up there. But it was one of NASA's great observatories. It's a gamma ray observatory. And the challenge in gamma rays, you know, we had a hard time focusing those x-rays. X-rays want to tunnel into the mirror. You can still manage with glancing angles, but gamma rays are so energetic that even the glancing angle trick doesn't work. They just embed in whatever it hits, or it goes straight through it. And so imaging in gamma rays just something very challenging to do. The technique deployed here, there are a number of gamma ray instruments, but let's just focus on the ones that you see on the corner. Each of the eight corners of this box-shaped spacecraft, you have a little detector. This is called BATSI, uh, the Burst and Transient Source Experiment. This is where I cut my teeth uh, scientifically. It's my first work with, with BATSI data. And basically, it works through triangulation. If something is emitting gamma rays, maybe a star explodes over here, gamma ray bursts are what I study. It's an exploding star that produces a lot of gamma rays. The radiation will eventually make its way to Earth, and it will hit the different detectors. Uh, some radiation might go in the detector in the lower left, some might go in the one in the lower right, maybe a smidgen on the ones down below, and over there, and nothing on the back side. So we can triangulate. If we got so much from this detector and a little bit from this detector, we know it came from that direction. So we can figure out where the gamma ray is released coming from. Because if a gamma ray comes and embeds itself in your detector, you can detect and say, okay, I detect a gamma ray, but you just really don't know where it's even coming from. This gave us a way to figure out where they're coming from, good to about a degree, which is, again, a huge part of the sky, one degree. For an astronomer, it's, there's a lot going on in one degree, but at least it was a beginning to figure out where the gamma rays were coming from. So some directionality. Now, Compton was brought down in 2000. This was more political. Compton could probably still be going, or at least could have run for most of the past decade. But in the late 90s, we had a couple of Mars disasters, uh, missions that we sent to Mars that didn't make it, didn't land correctly. One of them, we programmed stuff on miles instead of kilometers. It was a stupid mistake. So the spacecraft did not land like it was supposed to. And after those kind of high-profile failures, NASA was trying to be very careful. These spacecraft keep themselves pointed using gyroscopes, kind of like the top that I brought in. If you change the orientation, you can keep track of that. And the gyroscopes on Compton was failing, and unlike Hubble, it's not designed to be serviced. We've changed the gyroscopes on Hubble many times. And there are tricks you can use for operating on just two gyroscopes, and even one gyroscope if you're monitoring the magnetic field of the Earth, so you know where you are and where you're pointed. But they're worried because this is pretty heavy. It's the size of the shuttle cargo bay. And if it were to you know, lose control of its positioning and come down to Earth, parts of it would make it all the way down. In large cities like Mexico City or under the flight path, and it's like one in a zillion odds it would actually hit anybody, but they were trying to be extra cautious at that point in time. And once they got down to have a minimal number of gyroscopes, they decided to bring it down themselves in a controlled manner, instead of waiting for it to come down in an uncontrolled manner maybe a decade later. So they brought it down into the Pacific. And that's what we do with large spacecraft. We bring them down where they're not going to hit anybody. We check the shipping lanes, make sure no boats are there. Small ones just burn up, but the big ones, the frame of it can make it all the way down. So that's Compton. Its replacement is something called Fermi, but I'm going to talk about another spacecraft first, SWIFT. SWIFT doesn't count as a great observatory. It's kind of a mid-sized mission, mid-X we call it. But uh, SWIFT is important because it explored a new technology for localizing where the gamma rays come from. And this is kind of my bread and butter right now. Uh, I study these exploding stars. This is the spacecraft that detects it. Here's a drawing of it detecting one of these exploding stars in the gamma rays. Actually, it goes straight to my cell phone. So something may explode billions of light years away. The light traveled across the universe for billions of years. SWIFT detects it. 
It sends a message to Skynet that takes over all the telescopes immediately and also sends a message to my cell phone provider that once the cell phone provider decides to forward along, I get it. So I like to describe this as the longest distance phone call you'll ever get. It happens about once every three days. In fact, there was one this morning. It sounds cool, but it becomes less cool after oh, over a decade of this waking me up. But that's why I built these robotic telescopes. They respond for me. So I can just go back to sleep most of the time. Anyway, how does it localize them? Compton can only do it to about a degree. This uses a new technology called a coded aperture mask. And it was explored on Swift, which I'm showing you right now. Basically, over the front of the detector, they put this screen. It has a unique pattern. No part of it repeats any other part. And it blocks half the light. You're throwing away half the gamma rays. But what you get is a shadow casting that tells you where the gamma ray came from. So this is on the front of the detector. And if the light's coming in at an angle, you cast the shadow over here. If the light were coming in from the right, the shadow would be cast over to the left. So depending on where the unique pattern falls, the pattern's unique. No part of the coded aperture mask is the same as any other part. And so you can identify it, and then you can identify is it shifted to the right, is it shifted to the left? And that tells you whether the light came from the left or the right. So we can use this to localize things much more accurately. So by the time the message gets down to me, I know pretty much exactly where I need to look in the sky to see if I can see the fading remnant of the exploded star. So as prototype with SWIFT, uh, which is a mix of a gamma ray detector and X-ray and UV. SWIFT does all of those, gamma ray, X-ray, and ultraviolet. But the replacement for Compton is really Fermi. And here's a picture of Fermi. It was launched a couple of years ago, and it's on the modern gamma ray only ray detector. This takes us to the end of lesson four. Any questions about telescopes, optical, radio, or space based?